Shall we bow our heads together? Our gracious Father, again we are thankful for your love and we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for the hope that we have in Jesus. And Father, we would ask as we spend a few moments looking at your word, as we celebrate with the emblems that you have given us as a reminder of your sacrifice, that our hearts, our minds would be turned to Jesus, that we would behold him as our hope, that we would be filled with your grace, with your spirit, is our prayer in Jesus' name. new simple little word do you like new things anybody here that doesn't like new things probably you know you wouldn't admit you don't actually like some of us you know we do like some old things too though it's nice to have some antiques around the house apparently I found out from Pamela I'm one of them but that's okay (laughs) but nonetheless you know we like new things just kind of new anything we like new clothes now, I don't know, I may get in trouble, but ladies may like those a little more than men do, but we, you know, occasionally like some of those too, you know? I'm just curious, you know, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but have you bought some new clothes, and they're still in your closet? They've never been used, they've never been worn, they're still new, just that you can't take them back to the store and get your money back. You know, it's amazing how wonderful it looks there in the store, and by the time you get it home and it kind of sits, it's just not as exciting. Very quickly, it wears off. We like new toys. You know, we have different toys we like. If we're young, we like different toys than if we're old. You know, what's the saying? The difference between the men and the boys is the price of the toys. I don't know if that's just limited to men, but nonetheless... You know, we like them. We have our toys. As children, we have things that we like, that we play with. But how often? They don't last very long. The interest disappears very quickly. As adults, you know, it may change in what we like, and it may change in how much it costs, but we have them. We like to have the latest. Maybe we don't always do it, but you know, the latest phone, the latest technology, the latest computer, the latest whatever. We like them. Maybe you like new cars. I think most of us would like one. You know, it's not always an option or a possibility. You know, you might could guess what kind of new car the pastor would like. He's mentioned it once or twice, not often, but on occasion he's brought it up. But, you know, I have had people ask me, well, you know, if you got that new Corvette, how long would it be before you really were tired of it and didn't want it anymore? I don't know, I think it would go quite a while. If anybody would like to test it and find out, you know, feel free to talk to me afterwards and make arrangements to get it, and I'll keep it, and we'll see how long it lasts. But, you know, the truth is, whatever it is, there's a point that it becomes old. New homes. Now, you know, it's nice to have a new home. The moving part is never generally fun. But to have a new home, especially, you know, if it's that kind of dream home, that one that you always wanted. But the simple question is, how many new things will last? The truth is, is there any new thing that will last? On this earth, no. Nothing on this earth, no matter how special, no matter how much I treasure it, no matter how much I take care of it, no matter what, it's not going to last. Now the truth is, aside from the spiritual implications, most new things don't last very long anyway, do they? You know, that new car, as soon as you drive it off, it's a used car. As soon as you take that new home from the store, it's not new anymore. Nothing in this world lasts but Jesus, through Revelation, talks about when that will change, when everything will be different. Talking about the new Jerusalem, we talked about the millennium last Sabbath. And at the end of the millennium, as that holy city descends, 
the wicked surround the city and they are destroyed. And God starts over again. Verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Beautiful picture, you know. They talk about it. You know, every bride looks beautiful. Can you imagine what the new Jerusalem, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, not by, you know, our standards of what is impressive, what is beautiful, but God has adorned and has decorated and has prepared. Now again, we don't have time to look through the whole chapter and all the things it talks about the new Jerusalem the size, the dimensions, the foundation, the streets made of pure gold. But Paul talks and he says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love Him. Whatever you imagine, it's not even close. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be what? His people. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. And God will what? Wipe away every tear from every eye. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Do you look forward to that day? You know, we can comfort, we can encourage one another, we can share tissues, we can give an embrace, but ultimately we cannot truly wipe away the tears so they don't come back like the way one person put it very simply. You see that job ultimately God himself has saved and on that day when everything is new God himself will wipe away the tears and then they will never come back. Until then they flow from time to time. We understand, we accept, we sympathize but we look forward to that day. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make what? All things new. Everything. And you know, the beauty of it is, none of it will ever get old. You know, there will be no, well, I don't hear like I used to. I don't see like I used to. I used to have hair. It was a long time ago. You know, I used... Everything will be new and it will be perfect and it will be beyond our wildest imagination. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are what? True and faithful. There's a lot of things we hear, pretty much most everything we hear, isn't really true and it's not too faithful. But there is the Word of God, and God gives us a promise at the end of the book how it's going to end, and everything will be changed, everything will be new. All of the things that we were afraid of in this world will be gone. There will be no more fear, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow. None of those things, they've all passed away. And He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be what? My son. My friends, we talk about and we are today children of God. But there is this time when that estrangement will no longer be there. We will see our Heavenly Father face to face. We will be reunited with no longer sin to separate us. Everything will be new. The new earth. That that Jesus is preparing. It's the 28th of our 28 fundamental beliefs. 
on the new earth in which righteousness dwells, God will provide an eternal home for the redeemed and a perfect environment for everlasting life, love, joy, and learning in His presence. For God Himself will dwell with His people and suffering and death will have passed away. The great controversy will be ended and sin will be no more. All things, animate and inanimate, will declare that God is love and He shall reign forever. Do you long for that day, for that place? Whatever pet it is you want. Now I'll admit, you know, I've always wanted a pet lion. I don't think it would be a good idea right now. But there's a day when it will be as gentle as a little kitten. Now, you know, we have two cats at home. It's interesting. One of them is gentle. You can play with it, and it'll grab you, and it'll bite at you, but it just it's, it knows, you know, not to bite hard. We have another cat. You can't play with it that way. You know, it just doesn't know how to be gentle. It wants to play. It likes to play, but it just plays too rough. You know, if I play with it, I'm going to have marks on my hand or, you know, wherever. There's going to be some scratch. Never going to happen. Not one scratch. Not one time. Whatever the animal is. Everything in the new heaven and the new earth will be perfect. Peter, our scripture reading, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which what? Righteousness dwells. That place where everything is right with God. All that has been wrong will have been made right. Everything will be righteous. Revelation 21, verse 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that what? Defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? The new earth. Is it something that you're looking forward to? Is it something that you're excited about? Are you prepared for it? Are you doing things to get ready for that trip? You know, I realize some of us, you know, when we make a trip, we're last-minute planners. I'm guessing I'm not the only one here. Folks, I don't want to wait and start planning, start preparing at the last minute. Because the truth is... We're told that we don't know when the Lord is coming back. And we don't know when our time on this earth is over. We need to be prepared each and every day. We need to be right with Jesus. How do I prepare to be in the new earth? What is it that I need to do? The Bible tells us there's only one way. I must have my name written in the book of life, and that is by accepting Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Is your name in the book of life? Have you accepted Jesus? Revelation 12, verse 11, talks about that struggle. And the only way that any of us can be victorious, that any of us can be ready to meet Jesus when He comes, and they overcame Him by what? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony that they did not love their lives to the death. There is only one way to overcome. There is only one way to be victorious, and that is by the blood of the Lamb. It is a emblem, the emblem that we're going to partake of, representing Jesus' blood. It is the only hope that we have for a restored, for a new relationship with God. The only way to be in the new earth is to become new. You see, I must become a new person. The simple truth is, I wouldn't fit in the new earth. You wouldn't fit in the new earth. None of us as we are. We have to become new people. Now, I guess, you know, we could say some of us have done that. We've accepted Christ. we become new. But even then, there's still some changes that have to take place. But I need to become a new person. I need to become a new creation. And it is only possible through the blood of the Lamb. The promise given in Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit within you and cause you to what? To walk in my statutes, to walk in harmony with God's word. There is only one way you will ever be in harmony with this book, and that is with God's spirit dwelling in your heart and in your life. Now, you know, I may follow a few things in here, and the devil doesn't mind if I follow a few of them. In fact, he doesn't even mind if I follow the majority of them, as long as I don't follow all of them. As long as, you know, I pick and choose, well, you know, I'll follow what God said here, but I think here I'm going to do it my own way. And he's right, yeah, yeah, you do that. Good idea. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. The only judgment that really matters is God's judgment. It's not what I say or what I think. It's what God thinks. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Forever God will be united with his people. That land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be ours for eternity. And it will be better than Abraham ever could have imagined or Isaac, or Jacob, or anybody else could ever have imagined because God will make everything new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, there is that tension that we have in Christianity. Folks, how many of us are a new creation? I'd like to see a few more hands. I hope that, you know, we all are. And yet there's the fact that, yes, I'm a new creation, and yet, you know, I've still got some old things I'm still working on by the grace of God. But the beauty is, you see, God doesn't see me so much as I am. God sees me as the finished product. God gives me credit as long as I'm in Him. He knows where I'm going to end up. He knows what he can do. It's not about what I can do. We know that. I can do nothing. Now, I may fool a few of you, but I don't fool God. But God knows what he can do. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Do you want to be a new person? The Lord's Supper. We come together once a quarter to remember, to celebrate. It's about becoming new. It's about the blood of the Lamb. The emblem, the wine, representing Jesus' shed blood, representing His gift. You see, Jesus is the only thing that can wash away our sins. The song, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is only one solution to the sin problem in my life and your life. It's the same solution. We may have different sins. We may have different things we're struggling with. But the solution is the same. It is the blood of Jesus. Have you accepted his forgiveness? Have you accepted his gift? Have you accepted what he did for you? The blood that he shed for you, for us. Have you asked Jesus to change your life? To change your heart? To give you a new heart? To make you a new creation? The Lord's Supper is about accepting His life and His death. His death that paid for your sins and mine. But it's not just about His death. It's about His life. He is the one who lived that perfect life and gives it to us in exchange for our imperfect sinful life. I mean, you talk about the deal of a lifetime. You know, I don't know, you may have made some good deals in your life. I've made a few that I feel pretty good about, some I don't. You know, but the deal of a lifetime is that somebody would take my messed up life with all its problems, with all its issues. Oh yeah, there's a few, you know, that aren't so bad. Although if we really pull back the curtain and saw it from God's perspective, I don't know that I'd even be able to say that. 
but God who sees everything says, you know what? I will send my only begotten Son, and he who knew no sin will become sin for me, that I may become the righteousness of God in him. That's what this is about. When I partake that bread, the body, the life of Christ, it is about Jesus living out his life in us each and every day. Paul says, I die daily. Every day I have to start over again. And if I'm really honest, it may be more than once a day. It may be several times a day. Jesus says we must deny ourselves daily and take up our cross and follow him. Every day we need the blood of Jesus and we need the bread of life. You know, I just can't help but wonder a little bit of a comparison. How many of you had something to eat today? How many of you plan on having something else to eat today? How many of you even maybe plan on having a couple of meals later today? <laughs> I won't go beyond three. <laughs> but you know, I just wonder what would happen if I spent as much time eating literal food as I spend eating the bread of life. I wonder how many of us would lose a lot of weight. Now, I realize some of us can eat pretty fast, but I wonder. You know, we often don't miss a meal. You know, some of you talk to me about, you know, walking around there. But, you know, I do eat when I get home. I don't miss a meal. I may postpone it a little bit, but I don't miss it. I wonder spiritually, are we that careful to make sure we don't miss a meal? That we take time to come to the Lord's table, to eat the bread of life, to have the living water that Jesus offers to each and every one of us. Would you like to accept Jesus' offer of his blood, of his body? As we come to the Lord's table, we're reminded of his sacrifice. We come in faith accepting his sacrifice. We acknowledge the truth that we are sinners, and the only thing that we have to offer is our sin. And Jesus has everything we need. His perfect life, his perfect righteousness, his life, his death, his faithfulness. In a moment we will separate to wash one another's feet. And we do that to remind ourselves first and foremost, just as Jesus washed the disciples' feet, there is only one who can wash away our sins, and that is Jesus. But we are also reminded that we are called to serve as Jesus was willing to humble himself and take the role of a servant. It's kind of ironic how dare any of us think that we're too good to do anything any kind of service, any kind of sacrifice, when we look at what Jesus was willing to do, it is a reminder that he comes to wash away our sins and that we are to serve one another as he has served us. Do you want to ask Jesus to wash away your sins? Do you want to ask Jesus to live out his life in you? That is what we come to this table for, to acknowledge what Jesus has done, that he is our only hope, that is his shed blood, it is his life, it is he that has washed away our sins each and every moment of each and every day. Would you like to accept his offer? Because it is the only way that we will be a part of the new heavens and the new earth. Our gracious Father, we cannot begin to fully comprehend the sacrifice that was made that we might have hope in a future, that we might have a hope of that new heaven and that new earth where everything is made new, where there is no sorrow, there is no pain, everything is perfect. But Father, you have a work to do in our lives each and every day here and now. 
we ask that you would help us truly to come to your table each and every day, to come accepting your forgiveness, your shed blood, that we will remember that the only way we can overcome is by the blood of the Lamb, that we would accept your broken body, your life that was sacrificed for us, that we would be covered by your righteousness, that we would be filled by your Spirit, that we would be used by your Spirit to share your love and to share your grace, that one day very soon we can go to that new heaven and that new earth, to that place you have prepared for us because we have allowed Jesus to live out his life in us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen this time we will separate for those that want to take part in the foot washing service we would ask As we partake of the wine, before we do that, we will have a word of prayer. Wes will lead us, a prayer of thanks for Jesus' shed blood represented by the wine. I invite you to bow your heads as we kneel. Father in heaven, we come to you on this wonderful Sabbath day, the service that you have been instituted, instituted for us so long ago. Help us to think what it all means. May we always be prepared when we come for this service. Give us the wisdom, the thoughts. Help us to take the time to prepare. Lord, we can't thank you enough for what you did for us. We have no comprehension of the agony you went through in Gethsemane when you were hit with stripes scourged or when you're on the cross we'll never know but we love you so much for what you've done you've made it possible for us to be called your sons for us to have an opportunity to spend a lifetime with you help us to so live that we will be there we pray in jesus name amen
scripture records, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. I would invite you to bow your heads as we kneel and have a prayer of thanks for the wine. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the gift that you've given us, especially the gift of yourself on Calvary. And we thank you that not only was your body broken for us, but your blood was spilled for us. As we drink this wine, we want to say again thank you for making it possible for us to be reconciled <coughs> to you, because that would be the only way through the blood of Jesus. So we come today covered with that blood to make us pure in your sight, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
Scripture continues, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. invite you to stand for our closing hymn. Reminder, as you leave, we will take up an offering for our benevolent fund. Mm-hmm.